So um, our first speaker today is, um, you know, uh, the extraordinary Dave Cormier. Um, I don't see him. Where are you, Dave? Oh, there you are. Okay. I've actually gone. Sorry. <laughs> so I was looking for your scarf. Um, so I actually met Dave, I believe, somewhere between 2005 and 2006, and I actually didn't meet him. I became aware of him through a program called Ed Tech Talks. And for those of you who were here mm, probably in 2006, you may remember that Jeff Lebo and Jen Madrell came and did a presentation and talked about their um, uh, their. Well, they talked about a lot of stuff, including a tech talk. And so that's how I became aware initially of who Dave uh, uh, was, listening to him on these podcasts that he and Dave, uh, sorry, he and Jeff and Jen and others would do. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, George Siemens and, um, and um, uh, Stephen Downs had their, uh, their MOOC that they did, and, um, and I remember um, uh, and some of you also may have been in that MOOC uh, a long time ago. Okay, I see a hand back there. Awesome. Um, and, and so, um, uh, it, it, according to Wikipedia, Dave is the one who coined the phrase MOOC. Sorry. <laughs> he, he did. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I especially apologize to David Wiley for that as well. <laughs> um, so anyway, without any further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce you to Dave Cormier. Thanks for being here, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, the audio is working. That's perfect. Uh oh. I will try not to move very much. Um, I just need to tell you why I came here. <laughs> this is what I left behind. This is a picture from PEI two weeks ago. Um, I'm going to lie to you and tell you that's me. It's not really. Um, that the thing that person is walking towards, if you look at the angle of the picture, that's the part of the road they couldn't clear. And he's standing up on top of the bank, looking back at the part that they were able to clear. So uh, we've conquered great weather to get here. So just to give you a sense of where I come from in this process, um, I live kind of a double life. I work in an administrative capacity at my university. I am, let's call it, acting director of student engagement and strategy. I'm responsible for trying to help the university move, adapt, change to become as flexible as it can for the new generation of learners and for the realities of where we are in education now. And on the flip side, I'm also the person that Alex described. I worked at EdTech Talk in 2005 till now. We still do shows. And uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Stephen Downs and George Siemens on the first MOOC, so-called, in 2008. And basically, I am very interested in the possibilities of the web and what it means we can do with education. But I just want to take a bit of a step back and just give you more of a context of me as a teacher. Um, this is the letter H. Why is he showing me the letter H? In 1998, at the age of 23, Without any training, I walked into my first classroom in South Korea. Has anybody ever taught four-year-olds? Anybody? Yeah. So I didn't know what classroom I was teaching in. I didn't know where I was supposed to go. I walked into this building 15 minutes before my first class because I was lost on my way to get there. And the bell rang, and everybody went to their classroom. I'm still standing in the middle of the room. I got no books. I, got no, I have no idea what's going on. And the head of the school comes in and goes, why aren't you in your class? And I was like, I have no idea where I'm going. She goes, down the hall at the end of the hall. So I go down the hall at the end of the hall, and I walk in the door. And just as I walk in the door, little Luke has a chair over his head, just about to hit the kid next to him. So I walk in, and I grab the chair, and I put it on the ground, and I stand, and I look at these little four-year-olds, and I think, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so. Out of a moment of great genius, I say, pull out your books. Turns out they have them. They pull out their books, they put them on the table, and I say, open your books. And they open their books to the letter H. This is the first thing I ever taught as a teacher. 
So I'm teaching little Korean kids how to speak English. They don't speak any English at all. I'm only using the hand gestures. They've got the letters from A leading up to H colored in their books. And this is a replica of what I drew on the board. Does anybody identify this drawing? <sighs> all I can say is my helicopters have improved a great deal since then. The words that came into my head that started with the letter H were words like heliotrope <laughs> and helicopter. The word hat, house, anybody else? Any other H's? Horse. horse. Although I don't think I could have drawn a horse. Yeah, look at my helicopter. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And, uh, and they knew it. I mean, uh, four-year-olds are smart. And they're looking at me and they're thinking, ha, 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 ha. And so, you know, I went through that process, the first three, six months in a classroom that everybody's had at one time or another. And you slowly start to get your feet under you. And the whole time, I had this suspicion that deep down somewhere, there was a path I was missing. There's, a, there's an understanding of what education is, about what I'm supposed to be doing, that I didn't understand. That there's a track that I just wasn't on. You know what I mean? Like, if I did it right, if I gave people the right work, if I gave them the right assignments, if I gave them the right tests, my classrooms would start to work. And this, since that first day, has fascinated me. What is this thing that I'm supposed to be doing? What is the thing I was not doing that first day? And what am I supposed to be doing? What is the goal? What is that outcome? What is the thing that I'm trying to give in? What's that thing I'm trying to do? I got convinced that that thing was an object I was trying to hand over to my students. I mean, we've all been there, I think, at the start of the teaching process where we think that our goal is to get things into people's heads. Now, here's an object, here's a piece I want to get done. I can measure it at the end, I can prove that I'm doing my job properly. My first job at a university, or it's actually a community college, was in 2000. In 2000. I had 275 writing students. I have the organizing, organizational skills of a small rodent. <laughs> I chew up little bits of paper and I throw them in the corner and I stack little piles of them, right? So I, couldn't, I was terrible. And I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to do my job properly. How was I supposed to get this content into people's heads? Fortunately, I ran into the guy we were talking about earlier. This is Jeff Lebo. I think he's one of the great innovators in education that a lot of people don't know about. He was doing live webcasts with his students in 1999. He did a live webcast into China in 2003 where they had teachers in China going back and forth and he got his server shut down by the government after. He's done a lot of really, really great stuff. He did some really great stuff for me. He introduced me to the discussion forum in 2001. And I went on and I set up a discussion forum for my writing class and they got in there and all of a sudden, Instead of one assignment that I couldn't find in my office, I had one student who wrote 150 assignments. Just kept going and going and going and going. And the thing started expanding and expanding on me. And I was looking and I was thinking, well, that's not what I want. That's not the thing that I went out for going. I can't measure this. I don't know what's happening. I can't tell whether, like, how do I measure a student who's done 150 assignments against a student who did what I asked, which was 15? How do I make my classrooms work in this way? And then the next thing that happened to me is that I started at Tech Talk <coughs> with Jeff. And we started working with other teachers. And we started realizing that everybody was having the same problem. Everybody who put their stuff online ran into things like students working too hard, ran into things like the content taking off in ways that were not expected. And there were people who were clamping down that content behind passwords and paywalls and stuff, and other people who were just letting it go but didn't know what to do with it. So I started to dig in because the, the things, the possibilities that we were getting from the internet didn't match up against my understanding of education. It didn't match up against the myth that I had inherited being in the K-12 school system. This belief that the process of learning was something where I sat down and I took stuff from people and I did assignments and I passed them in and I was done. So I started to dig in. And the first guy I found was Pestalozzi. How many people know Pestalozzi? 
A couple of people who saw my talk at OLC. I love this guy. I talk about him all the time. Okay? I love this guy. So Pestalozzi decided in 1798 that he wanted to teach all of Switzerland how to read, how to write, how to do basic arithmetic. The man, he's, he's my educational hero. Now he did some dumb things too. But he had a big vision, and he was at a point of change in history where the idea of taking bits of paper and stamping them together and passing them around to people was suddenly a possibility, where the printing press was something you could use on a regular basis, where you could drive policy for an entire country to try to teach them how to do something. And in order to do that, he took learning as it was and tried to organize it into chunks so that everybody could do it. When you're trying to teach an entire country how to read, and you only have about 100 teachers, you've got you to innovate, right? So he decides that if you take instruction and you make it into a method that anybody can follow, and then you make a school book that can be used by any instructor, whether they're trained or not, that will teach people how to do stuff, all of a sudden, you've got the possibility to scale. Not 100 teacher, teachers teaching people, but anybody who could read could start at the start of the textbook and follow through to the end of the textbook and teach people how to read, how to write, how to do basic arithmetic. It was stuff that people really wanted to be able to do. He wanted to emancipate those people. So they had the possibility to participate, the possibility to read their own Bibles, the possibility to read what was going on in the political pamphlets of the time, things that were really important to them. This is uh, an American uh, report from 1876 talking about mandatory schooling in England. It started in 1870. In order to drive the Industrial Revolution, they decided what we need to do, we need to get every one of these kids into schools. We need them in there for two reasons. One, we want them to be able to do the basic writing, basic arithmetic stuff. More importantly, we want them to be able to show up on time. We want them to be able to do the jobs, do the tasks that are assigned to them. This is standard four from Birmingham, 1870. If you did not send your kids to school, you'd go to prison. In order for your kids to be allowed out of school in Birmingham in 1870, you needed to be able to read, the child needed to be able to read lines of poetry or prose at the choice of the inspector, clearly an inspector here who's going around and checking this stuff, sentence slowly dictated once by a few words at a time from a reading book, and basic arithmetic. Now, if you could do this, if you could pass level four, you could leave school. Maybe nine, maybe 10, maybe 11, maybe 12 years old. That school system, both Pestalozzi's school system, right, and the school system the British were talking about building was designed for the factories. These are the kids that they were trying to pump out of those school systems. This is from the dark satanic mills, the cotton mills, where the kids sort of ducked in and out, took the little pegs out, pulled them down, put them back on, bring them up, put them down. If you go to, if you're ever in England near Leeds, there's a place called Salt Air where they still have one of the mills up. And you can see the indents on the floor in the, in the granite where the kids walk back and forth. That's what the school system was designed to do. There's the little pegs. Was to prepare these kids for the world. Take this content, put it in their heads. Once they obey and pass the system, we allow them to go through. Success in that educational model is finishing, right? Go through, finish it. When you're done, you're done. That's the myth that I inherited. Is a school system where I go in and once I'm done, once I do stuff, I'm finished. I go out into the world and having gotten my degree or having gotten my, K, my grade 12, whatever, is the end goal of the learning process. And it's built into the way we look at it. It's built into the way we design curriculum it's built into the way we talk about outcomes. It's about imparting things to people. It's about that end goal, right? It's a single thing. There's the tree. Let's talk about it. It's finished. It's got an apple. We're done. 
What I'm going to propose to you today, hopefully I can finish in time to have you fight with me about it, <laughs> is a different model. That tree is a single entity. What I'm going to propose to you today is that weeds form the basis of the myth that we need. That flexibility, that resilience that comes from the weed. We need to talk about how we can conceive of the whole education system as doing something different for a different purpose than the one that we inherited. So I propose the rhizome. Does anybody recognize this plant? This is a Japanese knotweed. It is the probably second most nefarious plant on the planet. It is aggressive and resilient and it goes everywhere and once you get it, you cannot get rid of it. I've had it in the back of two of my houses. It is impossible to get it out of it. You can dig down, you can poison it, it doesn't care. The important part though is that we went from one, from that single thing, here's a piece of content, to many. And the weed is always many. There's no center, there's no starting point, there's no ending point. And while we're talking about this, think about what this means for education. It's not start of the book to the end of the book. You start in the middle. If you learn something on the internet, it's all interwoven and interconnected. We don't need to break down the content, put it in a book, put it in a truck, send it out to people. Those starting points are artificial. And I think that a lot of those starting points, the tree version of this, is a question of the technology that we inherited. The book forces us to start at the beginning. It forces us to walk page by page through it to the end. But the interconnected pieces that we have now, it means we don't have to do it anymore. Problem is they're also difficult to contain, right? So if you're actually designing something, you say, well, start in the middle and keep going, it's going to wander off in directions that you don't expect. You're going to get things that you can't measure. You're going to go in directions where things are going to come in that you don't necessarily like. So a colleague of mine from Sweden was saying, was working this way a couple of, the, a couple of months ago now, and when she was talking about the Charlie Hebdo stuff with her students, the cartoon uh, tragedy that happened in France, and she said, well, go out onto the internet and see what you find, and come back and we're going to talk about it. They're doing cultural studies. And the curriculum of that class ended up being the pieces they found, and some of it was pretty graphic. Some of it was... People had different positions. It was a very uncontained situation, very similar to the normal situation that those kids would have because they already have access to all this stuff. And they ended up following their own paths through that. So you end up with 25 kids who come back with 25 different experiences. Each individual starts to follow their own path. Success, and this is true, you know, when we look at our schooling system, again, the one we inherited, you can pass, you can get a 76%, you can get a 90. But when we look at our lives, when we look at the decisions we need to make, whether those decisions are about you know, what technology we're going to use or whether or not our child should have a cupcake, the decision process always looks a little bit more like this, a little bit less like this. You know, That success process is always kind of a wandering road. And to me, we can incorporate that into the learning process. We get that into our minds all the time, that the struggle to wander around and make sense of things is the way that we actually do it anyway. It changes the way that we look at preparing for education. So the rhizomatic learner then lives in a special kind of network. When we think about networks, you know, network learning, and we've been talking about this for 10 years, networks always seem to look like this. They're all tidy and they've got one line and one line connects to another and it connects to another. I don't know about you, my life doesn't much look like this. <laughs> the paths to finding stuff out aren't like this for me. It's a stutter step and I forget what I'm doing and there's a piece that I have that's totally wrong. And when my students come into my classroom, they have all scattered bits of knowing and thinking that happen. They've got all these different thoughts. And you'll have one student who knows one piece of the puzzle has already pre-existing ideas of what's going on. And then you have another student who has a totally different conception of what's going on. And they're in the same class together. And ostensibly, they're all supposed to learn the same things. And again, the technology we had meant that we had to bring the same things to the classroom for everybody. Because it had to go on a truck and it had to come around. So you had the pieces you could gather and the pieces in your head. 
But as we move forward, those pieces don't need to be static. We can work with this one and work with this one. Work with the different students to make new connections, to work out that map, right? And then end up with this as the goal for that rhizomatic learner. So this is the outcome that I'm looking for in my classroom. I'm expecting my students to be confused and to have struggled and to end up with different pieces, one from another, to come out with different outcomes from the same course. So how do you actually go about doing that? Right, so what would you actually do? How would you actually set up a classroom that anybody would ever allow you to teach? Right, that anybody would ever allow you to teach that could look like this? Well, I have, I have some colleagues who do a really good job, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend my own, because uh, I know it better. The first thing I do is I start with a learning contract. How many people do contracts? Oh, that's good. So learning contracts, 60s and 70s, there's some really, really great research that was done. Um, it's tied to the andragogy approach to learning, and I won't bore you all with wandering down the andragogy road, but I will say that if our fine friends from the 60s and 70s had had the internet, they would have been a lot more successful with their education theory, because they were trying to open up education, but they were tied down by what they had available. They couldn't make the kinds of connections that I'm talking about now inside their classrooms between people and between content because they, they just didn't have it, right? It wasn't there for them. So the way that I do those classrooms, so I teach educational technology and the adult learner at the University of Prince Edward Island. And I teach um, mostly college um, faculty uh, and then a smattering of other folks. So I'll end up with uh, somebody who teaches boat pilots how to pilot giant freighters. And I teach a crazy cross-section of the population. Really, really fun course. Average 40, 45 years old. And we sit down and we go over the learning contract. So I have a, a statement of what I believe that looks like what I just said, hopefully explained better than I just did, and what they're going to commit to doing, what work they're going to commit to doing what effort they're going to make, what choices they're going to make. I go so far as allowing them to pick their final grade, where the passing grade in that course is 75. And then I advise them to pick 75 or more. Um, seriously, I have to tell them that. Um, because it's so new. I mean, they're very smart people. But the concept is new, because I'm trying to give them control of the process. Because what I want them to do is own the learning process. The content's out there already. The only thing I'm actually providing as an educator is a path, right? My path, and hopefully it helps them choose their own. So all the assignments inside of it are pass-fail. And it's pass-fail in the sense where it comes in and I go, yeah, no, you can do that again. It gets sent back to the point where it passes. And then, they, so they'll pick an 80, they'll pick five assignments and the blog posts and whatever else, and they send them in. But it gives them the control of that process to go out and pick the things they're going to follow and then contribute that back to the classroom. Problem, of course, is the measurement. How do you actually go about measuring the learning process when you don't know what people are going to learn? You don't know what they're going to come to class with. You don't know what they're going to work on. I'll give them direction. I'll give them suggestions. I'll give them sort of context to work in. But I don't know what they're going to work on. So I can't set up a rubric for this. That involves me measuring whether they know anything. So that old myth simply doesn't work for me. I can't measure whether or not they've acquired content. Not across the course and certainly not compared against each other. And we need to measure learning in order to be inside of our systems. The problem is. The fact that we need to do it doesn't actually make it possible. And this is what I've come to terms with, is that I refuse to have the teaching I do online controlled by the fact that I need to measure it. Because as soon as I start to measure it, as soon as I start to measure the content acquired, the system falls apart. So now I measure effort. And I negotiate with them on the contract for the effort they do. And I take the responsibility to myself to make sure that they're learning in that way that all of us can tell 
when you work with students whether or not they have learned a thing that we're doing. Right? So I advise people trying to do this to trust themselves, to trust their own instincts, and then mark the effort that people are doing. And when I get cross-examined on this, I say the same thing to people. If you have two people coming out of a course and you're going to hire one of them, and one of them can prove that they had a really high recall of content, and the other one can prove that they worked really hard, which one are you going to choose to work with? Yeah, how many people are not going to pick the hard worker? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And this is the thing. And we know this is true. The labor market says it's true. Our own instincts say it's true. The thing we actually want from people, we want their creativity. We want to know that they do their job. We want to know that they're willing to work hard. And then when they come to whatever context we're in, whatever job we work with, whatever we're trying to get done, they're going to learn the bits and pieces of that local context because they're willing to apply to it. That's the way that our world works. There are very few jobs, jobs, that you can actually learn in a school. I don't care if you're a plumber. The point where you get to work and you apprentice is the point where you actually learn the subtleties of your trade. You learn the details, maybe in the school, but the, the real skill, the real literacies of your trade are learned once you get out there. So if you're going to try this, and this is what I'm going to suggest, how would you go about developing something inside of the work you do? How would you design some of this inside of a course? And I guess my suggestion, this is from RISO 14. Does yeah. so anybody, any RISO 14ers here? Anybody see the course? Oh, one. That's good. Oh, David Wiley, yes. So last year we had an open course. Um, some people would call a MOOC. Tend not to use the word very much anymore. I invited a bunch of people to come and help me answer that question. How would we go about helping people include this into the work that they do? How can we think about the learning process where everything is in the middle, where answers are multiple, where there's no real content that we're imparting, where what we're trying to do is encourage creativity and not knowing? So the advice that I have is to try the weekly challenges. I have a prof at my university who did a great job, who's doing really interesting stuff right now. We've been working on this for a couple of years. And she is, uh, she's doing marketing, and marketing is perfect for this. So they have a challenge, they have a weekly challenge, where they say, here's this issue, go on out, find the pieces, come back, and we'll build the curriculum from there. So the curriculum is built by the students, and then her job is to come in and work with them on the stuff they found and talk about the literacies that they need to be able to evaluate that stuff, to be able to pull that stuff together, to be able to do good work with the things that they found to do a better job finding stuff next time. Because this is what they're going to be doing when they make it out of the university. Right? This is the model that their work life is going to look like. Not a structured, organized environment where they open a textbook and follow from page 45 to page 62 because life doesn't so much look like that. At least I haven't found that textbook yet. So five points to think about. So maybe we'll sit there for a second. Questions? I'm about halfway, a little over halfway done. Comments? Yeah, go ahead. How do you deal with accreditation? Well, again, when you're, how do you deal with accreditation? We don't do accreditation in Canada like you guys do it here. So I'm not in a position to give you direct advice on that. Um, the accreditation that we do do in Canada allows room for things that address complexity. So there are things in any field that are, um, <coughs> I say simple in the sense that we can identify, point to them, you need to know this thing. Uh, to use the pipe fitter example, you know, there are these things that you need to be able to do. There are these steps in the process. There are these approaches to these things. There are grades and whatever. Not a plumber. Um, but there are also complexities involved in all these systems. And there's room for us to um, 
account for how we're doing those kinds of things. So how would you deal with those kinds of situations? And that's why I say first step is really to find pieces that you can do that for. Find the complexity inside of the curriculum and design for that spot first. Does that answer your question? So a person, one person chooses they want to get an 80, another person chooses they want to get a 99. Yep. Do you evaluate their work to the to different standards? No, I, they're, they're choosing how much work they wish to do. So the person who chooses 99 is choosing probably to do three or four more assignments than the, than the 85 person. And again, what I'm looking to measure is the amount of effort that goes through. Whether or not each assignment is done well is something that gets evaluated at, at each point of the assignment. I just don't give them a specific grade on it. So it's zero or one. And the zeros get handed back. And they come back again. Or um, they don't get their grade. Oh, Sorry, I don't think she saw you behind there. That's OK. Just We'll go up here. We'll take another. And then maybe I'll dive back in. How does your model scale up? I have, uh, where I um, am at a dental school, it's yes. one faculty member to 123 students in Is a that class. A single class, 123 students? Yep. No help, no nothing, and year-round teaching. So how would you scale that up? Because you're, what you're talking about is like a competency-based kind of thing, and you're talking about an individualized curriculum for each student? It's not an individualized curriculum created by the teacher, though. I mean, that's the distinction. The individualized curriculum is created by the group that's out there. Which is very interesting, but at the end of the day, they still have to know how to make a crown. Like they have to produce a, something that's a, a known skill in their profession. They have to be able to. Yeah, and, and like I say, there are parts of these that, we look at all the things that we learn. There are parts of it that fall into that simple category that are things that are direct pieces that need to be done. But I mean, take the crown filling, for example. I don't know from dentistry, but when I think of something like welding, the process of knowing how to weld and being able to weld are totally different things. There's a subtlety in there. There's a complexity in there. There's a, there's a movement of the hand and a mixture of the whatever. That's not something you can learn from a book. It's something you learn from practice and application. So to me, those would be the places where you would focus to try to build out curriculum that did that. A situation with 123 students and one faculty member, my advice to that person is hold on. You know what? That's not a point of innovation. That's a point of desperation. I mean, when you're at points of desperation, innovation is, I mean, find another, like get another person, help that person out. You know, uh, that's, that's tough. Um, I don't think that means that you can't do some of these things. I just think that, I mean, sharing time is different with 123 people. Um, you're not going to be able to do the sharing time in class. But you can do it on the web. And you can actually create that kind of group environment. You'd have to break them into pieces to do it. Um, seven, eight, and I don't want to sort of design something here for you on the fly. But you'd have to break those people out. You'd have to assign them groups. And you'd have to have ways for them to engage effectively there. And I mean, again, that's with one, no, no TAs, nothing with that 123. <sighs> Help them. <laughs> Sorry, we'll take one more and then I'm going to go back into sort of some of the things to think about. Go ahead. Uh, as much as I hate to admit it, I've actually taught contract packages oh, okay. at, at the middle school level. Um, and I found them to be incredibly instructionally effective, especially for differentiating instruction among <laughs> students. My question, Dave, is this. Uh, to my way of thinking, a contract is like a primitive form of a rubric. What, what's your response to that? Contract is a primitive form of a rubric. Interesting comment. One, but just to cover first, why would you be embarrassed to say that you've done contract? Because you mentioned the 60s. Oh. <laughs> I'm not willing to admit to no, that. No, no, there's lots of people still doing them now. I didn't mean to imply that. Jeez. I totally missed that. That's so funny. Um, oh, no, yeah, yeah. 
when really smart people were doing education, they were using contracts. Um, like a primitive form of rubric. Yes, I agree with you. And that's its power. Um, the rubric totally defines, well, depending on how you do it, but it defines the outcome. It makes it clear, it makes it definitive. And the thing that I'm arguing about is that a, the vast quantities of what we do are not clear and definitive, no matter what field you're in. There's a reason why we have apprenticeships on the outside of a lot of our fields. Because at some point, the non-definitive needs to be passed on. And I think the rubric restricts us from having that conversation inside the classroom, where the contract opens up room for that, opens up room for complexity, opens up room for the crazy abundance that we have in our educational, like when we look at content now, we look at connection, possibilities, the abundance is staggering, right? And the rubric is an attempt to pull that all together. And what I'm suggesting is there are places where we should let it go. So yeah, I agree, I really like that, actually, the way you put that. So I'm gonna dive back in and talk a little bit about the things that I think about whenever I'm trying to do this in a classroom. So the first is the idea of cheating. Cheating is tied to assessment, it's cheated to the, to the idea that we hide the answer from people and that somebody sneaking the answer somehow is, is cheating, is something that's not allowed inside of our education system. It's the exact opposite of collaboration. The idea of cheating in, in the workplace would be silly. Oh, you have the answer to that, give it to me so I don't have to find it. It's a totally normal human process. And yet, when we walk into an education space, we say, nope, we're gonna lock down the answer so I can keep my multiple choice test working. And if anybody finds them, I'm toast because I'm gonna have to write a new one, right? We lock this stuff down and we make it. So if this is gonna work inside of that 15% of a curriculum you carve out for complexity, you have to see cheating as learning. That idea of going out and finding the answer from somebody is a good thing. Now, you should say where you got that answer from. But that collaborative spirit, that idea of somebody going is to me exactly what we should be encouraging. Because that's where the real learning happens. It's in those between spaces. So if I try to explain to somebody how to use, if I try to explain to somebody how to lobster fish, I grew up on lobster boats, my explanation is not going to be fully clear because I did it, I grew up to it, it's automatic to me. And like so many people in that situation, I'd be an expert trying to explain to an non-expert. As soon as you get students explaining to each other, you get the other side of that context. I'm not saying you remove the expert, but having that student interaction provides the other end of the context for learning. You've got somebody who is discovering an understanding of something at a non-expert level, the same non-expert level as the person next to them. So this cheating process is something I try to stay focused on whenever I'm designing this stuff. This is, I mean, it's all paradox, right? We're trying to enforce independence. Go out there and be independent. I'm telling you to do it. And that struggle, I think, is at the core of trying to design this stuff. So for me, the contracts and all this work and all the rhizome stuff is about trying to create, trying to make people independent in their learning. Because I want them to pick up the literacies that they need to go and find the next answer after the course is done. The next time they're confronted with something outside of what we're doing, that they have the literacies they need to evaluate the information they're getting. That they have the ability to go out and find those things that they have the ability to collaborate, they've created the networks they, ha they need to be able to learn later, right? That they can be independent in the work that they're doing. That's good. So in this, in all the stuff I've said, there's an awful lot of uncertainty. And that rubric, the beauty of that rubric is you know exactly what's gonna happen. You know exactly what you're looking for. And when you walk into the classroom, you know you're gonna have the answer to the questions that are being asked. <laughs> when 25 people, or 123, it's too many, <laughs> or 123 walk in all with different answers, there's gonna be a lot of uncertainty there. There's a lot of things you're not gonna know the answer to. And for those students, 
when they go out, I had the first year I taught with a contract at the university, I had two 45-year-old students in my classroom start to cry in the middle of the class, eight-hour class. Should never be taught at eight hours. But they wanted to know what success looked like. They wanted to know what work they needed to do to succeed. And my answer was, I don't even know you yet. You know, you're different from you, and I don't know where you're at yet. And we're all going to try to get somewhere, but odds are you're going to come out of this class knowing something different than someone else will. Now, that's always been true in our classroom. But I'm trying to make that central to what the classroom looks like, to what the learning experience looks like. And it's difficult for some educators. It's also really difficult for students to embrace that uncertainty to not know what success looks like and still work. Again, life is like that. You're waving your arms up there. It's more than uncertainty with some students. Can you point out the? It's more than uncertainty with some, some students. Yes. You know, I've been trying to stop myself from, from, uh, from saying this, but I'm, um, I'm having a crisis about online teaching. The, the sense of entitlement that students come in with uh, in terms of, you know, what do I have to do to get my A? Uh -huh. Or I'm not going to let you get between me and my A. Mm -hmm. Seriously, said in public in my online discussions. Um, going directly oh, to the um, uh, department chair without ever saying anything that, you know, that um, you know, they, they just want to know what they have to do to get their A, or none of their other teachers make them blog or use <laughs> voice thread or tweet or whatever. All they want to do is the paper and, uh, and whatever, you know, other thing that, that their other teachers have, their other online teachers have them do. And so it's so frustrating when you're trying to do some of this stuff. Like, I'm getting really emotional about this because I'm not teaching this semester because of this issue. Um, so how can, how can you uh, force students to embrace that un uncertainty? I don't know why I'm, why I'm so emotional about this, but I love teaching. Mm -hmm. I love online teaching. But this sense, and I teach graduate level students, not mm -hmm. undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. I'm so frustrated by it that I'm not teaching this <laughs> um, So how do, you, how do you get them to take responsibility for their own learning? I mean, this is the systemic problem, right? I mean, we've all seen the, the teaching to the test, and you guys, have, you guys are more challenged here, I think, than, than we are in Canada, but it's still coming for us, too. I work, part of my day job, I work with the government in the particularly 9 to 12 part of our system to help students transition into university. And this is exactly what we're seeing all over the place. We have parents who are going in to talk to principals and saying, I don't like the grade that Jimmy got on his paper, his English paper, the other day. I want it reevaluated by an independent third party. <laughs> in grade 11. <laughs> and they want to know exactly why a 78 is a 78 and not an 80. Right? This is the education system we built. And go back 30 slides and go back to where we were in 1870, measuring exactly what somebody could do so they could make it out to a factory. We've still got the same education system. For what? What does that grade do for that student? It allows them to get to the next step in the same broken system. The answer is long and hard and about courage, right? It's about going back into the classroom next year and doing the same thing. It's about getting together with people like this and going, okay, we need to think about the mythology of education different than what we do now. If we accept what, and it's not that there's anybody who believes it. There's no person out there driving the old system. We just inherited it. And they needed it. Pestalozzi needed it. I don't so much like what the British government did with theirs, but I understand why they were doing it. They wanted those cotton factories to run. We're not living in that world anymore. Somehow, we need to get together and change that view of what the education system is for. Urgh. I totally agree with you. This uncertainty in the process, and we work with high school, there's a, what's her name? 
always, she's such a great educator. It's an educator in Colorado, Loveland, Colorado, Monica Hardy, who started a school with no walls down inside the community, all kinds. Look up Monica Hardy on the internet. I won't start because it'll be 15 minutes later and I'll still be here talking about the really cool work she does in Loveland, Colorado. But she always talks about the unraveling of the belief that the student has at the start because they're programmed into this system. You know, the not really great Harvard Business School research that says if you do 10,000 hours of something, you become an expert. 90% of our population has spent more than 10,000 hours sitting in a chair, listening to somebody go like this at them, and writing tests. We are experts at being passive learners. Experts now at doing what you're talking about, which is trying to gain the system to gain more artificial points in a non-existent game. Experts. You riled up. Because for me, what I'm trying to do as a teacher, every time I walk in the classroom, is I'm trying to make myself obsolete. If I can finish a course, and the last day of class nobody looks at me, because they're doing stuff, and they're presenting, and they're doing the stuff, and then all of a sudden they go, are you still here? That's what I'm looking for. If you center yourself in the middle of a classroom, and you are the font of all knowledge, that I gotta get you riled up, round me up every time I do a talk. Ah! If you're at the center and you're the font, at the end of that classroom, you sever the connection. If you have all your content inside of, I'm gonna take a little side swipe here, inside of an LMS, and you organize everybody to do the same thing, at the end of the course, you sever the connection. All of those things they built up are gone. If you let them go out and build their own connections, when the course ends, nothing different happens. They keep on going. When we ran RISO 14, that open course last year, at the end of six weeks, I stopped teaching. Barely teaching, but I stopped. The students took over the course and taught six more weeks. And they just kept going. They're still together now, a year later. Because for them, the community was the curriculum that they were learning. An understanding of what it is to know inside of that space. To me, we all need to be asking this question in order to address some of the issues that Alex is talking about. Why are we teaching? What's the outcome? Not at the, I mean, we need to talk about the practical level. But there's an awful lot of people who raise their hand as administrators. There's an awful lot of people here who I'm sure are listened to by administrators as well. We need to be asking this top level question. What do we want to have come out of our system? Do we want these whiny little entitled passive learners? Or do we want creative, engaged, connected learners? And if we want the second, we have to teach differently than we do. So for me, the community is both the vehicle for the curriculum, in the sense that they go out and find stuff and bring it together. But it also is the goal of the curriculum, making those connections, finding the spaces where you can know. It's the myth that we could build to replace the one we had where what we're trying to do is help people grow, not just know things, not just recall things, not abuse people about testing. So that what success is not finishing, but never finishing. Thank you.